Welcome to What's Poppin'. I am super, super pumped to be talking to Rafael Casal today. Rafael, how are you? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm, I'm just working on this, trying to get this show done. <laughs> <laughs> Like I was saying right before we started up on this video here, this jacket that you're wearing is amazing. And you got it in a very underhanded way, some would say. Took it from props. Yeah, I'm, yeah I, I, you know, I got to, I wore it in the show and I was like, I really think I should get to keep wearing that to kind of feel the character. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm actually just doing character research right now into a, a version of myself. <laughs> you know, some people like they work on Star Wars, they take back a lightsaber or whatever. You just get to take back an A's jacket. I'm taking back shit that I would wear anyway. <laughs> <Just crazy. laughs> so you're here to talk to us about the blind spotting series, the series, and this for those of you that don't know, and I'm going to give you the synopsis I was given, but you give me your pitch after because sometimes they don't always match up. I mean, great. to be honest, I probably wrote what you're about to read. <laughs> okay, let's see. Six months after the events of the film of the same name, Ashley and her son are forced to move in with her boyfriend's mother and sister following his arrest as Ashley's partner of 12 years and father of her son, uh, Miles is suddenly incarcerated. This situation leaves her to navigate a chaotic and humorous existential crisis when she's forced to move in with Miles' mother and half sister, June thirteenth on Stars. I didn't write June thirteenth on Stars. I wrote everything else. <laughs> everything else. All right, cool. That was a good one. Sometimes we get synopses that are like they're just not. They don't flow well. You know what I mean? Like you could tell they're right by like a clunky sort of PA that was given everything secondhand and they don't really know what to do. But like. It, this was very well, well done. No, I don't know. I don't know that I really know how to write a good bio. I think I just know what I don't want to tell people before they watch it. And so I can just like circumvent all those things. And, but super excited to talk to you about this because Blind Spotting is a movie I've loved a ton. Um, in this, obviously, in the in the movie, you you, know, you starred, um, you were you did a bunch. You're you're a writer, star, and producer. But now you're also director. And like we were saying before, you're the showrunner. And just that has to be so much more responsibility now, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you're, you're taking on a different scale of production. Um, but I think it was, it, was a, it was a bigger responsibility for all of us, right? Like, I think all the actors are under a different criteria because it's going to go to so many more people and the budget is different. And luckily, the, the core sort of team, me, David, Jess, and Keith, who've been working on the movie for years, we all are doing the show together. And so it's made it's made it a fun project amidst sort of the challenge of what television is. It's weird because like, this is, I feel like such almost more than anything else with um, any like showrun or anything else. This is really like your baby. And like, how do you know, like how do you balance wanting to keep control of certain things and knowing when to defer to someone else? I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think the same way you do in anyone's real life, you know, like you defer to people who've earned your trust that they're experts. And I think what's really great about getting to go through a hiring process of looking at who are going to be responsible for the many different facets of the show you find really brilliant artistic collaborators and you trust them right this is you think of like our our set designers and our decorators and stuff like they this is what they've dedicated their lives to and so i think in the same way that we're really obsessive about you know the scripts and the story and the way the characters come across and the music and things we try to find people who are as obsessed with their role in a larger production and then really just trust the muscles that they've built to do that job well you know i do think like making a show or a film is about the collective wisdom that you've put together and so i think we try to manifest as much collective wisdom and goodwill towards the project as possible at the beginning and, and, and help that get us to the finish line I, look, me and David have never made TV before, so we don't have like a playbook of how to do this. We're like rapper, poet, theater kids. You know, like that's where we come from a particular kind of like collaborative collectivism. So, and I think that's more and more true for new people getting to create television and film, especially people who are from sort of off the beaten path of what I think a lot of people sort of publicly think of as like the Hollywood machine. Like we don't really have any orientation to that. And so I think we... We get to sort of come in using what we know about how to make a thing good. And that really is about um, protecting the energy of your project above all else and, and making it as collaborative as possible and making sure that, that, you know, while we have deliverables, we have things we have to turn in because somebody's bankrolling this whole thing. You know, we're trying to make a piece of art that we can all feel seen by and fall in love with. I think that means that in order to do that in an inspired way, everybody needs to feel like fully activated in there in their role in the process. And so for me, like as a, you know, as the showrunner of the show, which is, you know, sort of sounds like you're, 
I don't know. That title is really misleading to me. I'm, I think other motherfuckers probably like really love that because it sounds like you're super in charge. But like, I don't I, I feel like the actual job is that you work for everybody. Like you actually work for the most <laughs> people and you're trying to get everyone to work in tandem with each other. And so you become the voice box between departments that don't have time to just keep meeting all the time. And so like you're sort of the. You're, you're the person walking around with the big book with all the notes in it and all the pictures from everyone's thing. You'd be like, oh, well, this department's doing this. So what if we did something that kind of felt like this? And then they go off and dream for a while. And you go take that book to the next department and go, well, well they just said they're <laughs> going to work on this. So how about, you know, you're just trying to help everyone conspire towards the same shit. Uh, and that that kind of feels like at the end of the day, what the what the what our gig is on our show. I can't speak for other people, but like that. That's the approach that we found. So you and David had written the original movie over the course of like nearly a decade. You obviously don't have as much time to write or didn't have as much time to write this series. Was that ever like while you're doing the movie, like in the back of your heads, like we might want to make this into a TV show one day. We might want to make this into another movie. We might make to make this into anything else. Or was it always just because I'd seen other interviews where you're like, we only ever wanted to make this singular piece. But like it just turns out that we really had these other stories that we wanted to, you know, expand upon. Yeah, I mean. Look, first of all, it's not like we like sat at a computer for 10 years straight and worked on a script. This would, <laughs> yeah. this would be like, the, it would be the greatest thing we'd ever made if that's what it was. We worked, we worked and tried to get this made for 10 years. We did a full page one rewrite right, of the movie a month before we shot it because we hadn't touched it in two years. Um, and so I think, I think Davian and I are particularly like well-versed in, in procrastination and execution at the last minute, unfortunately, but like, that is the role, like, that's the muscle, right? Like you, you want to change stuff up until the last minute anyway. So, so much of our job is like talking, 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 right. And then go do it, you know, but it's the most time thinking about the thing, the same thing that you do. With, and like music is the same way you like. You spend all this time learning about music and st listening to music and talking about the kind of songs you want to make, blah, 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 blah. And then like you just go into the studio, you spend a, a studio session and you knock out a thing and you're like, well, that's the thing that we made. In a lot of ways, that's what the movie was. It was like, well, that's what we made. Uh, you know, that is the collective, um, you know, influence of all the art and all the artistic merit that we've had up until this point. Here it is. And I think when we were sort of with this idea of, of making a TV show, it was like, well, we just didn't, we, it wasn't intuitive for us why we would continue that story. Cause that story had an ending already. Like we, we spent time with Colin and Miles. Um, but television, it, you know, like it wouldn't, if somebody was like do a sequel to the movie, we definitely, it would never happen. Like never in a million years. But TV presents this, like TV is about worlds. And I think the thing that we loved about the movie that we did want to go back to if we could was the world, you know? And so I think there was like a, well, it'd be, if we went back to that world, who would we want to spend time with? I think that became the question and, and the answer for obviously for us really intuitively and right away was, was Jasmine. We wanted to see Ashley and we wanted to see the kind of people that would populate her world that maybe we didn't get to populate with Colin and Miles' story because it was so focused on their dynamic. But what was the writing process like as far as how you compared it to the the movie? Because when you're writing for a series, obviously there's so much more dialogue, so much more everything. Like everything becomes now multiplied by so much more because you're stretching it out over a series. How did you approach that versus how you approach the movie script? I mean, the movie script was, I mean, the last version of the movie script was just me in a room, you know, with a bunch of like movies playing on a screen for a month, right? You know, because David was off shooting a, a a, a series at the time and so there wasn't even time for us to like be in the room together and write for that last version it was just me in a room and then at, like every night at midnight <laughs> or every couple of days I'd be like okay here's I wrote it you know I'd like describe scenes to him because sometimes I didn't even have time to for us to like sit and read before like the week was up so I would do like a week of writing and then we would read and we would talk and we'd work with our producers and they would give notes and uh, I was a little bit more of like the conduit for all of the the writing and I think what's great about the show is one, me and David really did get to co-write it the way that we wanted to by being in the room together. And then also we got to bring in all these other people into our writing process, which was really beautiful. Like we got to bring in um, Alana Brown and Nigel Moomin and uh, Priscilla Garcia Jaquer and, and Ben Turner and, you know, getting these other writers in on the voice of it allowed it to feel like the expansion of the world was really natural. Like we knew Colin and Miles really well, but writing 
five new, essentially five new protagonists, four of which are women. Like we wanted to make sure that it was done right and and felt felt sort of you know honest and true to the characters and had all those little details that like you know I, I, look I'm a I'm a writer that feels like you can write for anyone you just kind of got to write the shit that you have some way into and then you have to have checks and balances to make sure that you're not one you're not being irresponsible with somebody's narrative right and then also that like that those little details that make a story really good you don't because you haven't personally lived them you don't miss you know, and so I think the great thing we got to do with the TV show because there's more of a budget and there's there's more potential for collaboration because we're not in that indie world where like people are like just looking for geniuses. You know, the indie world is all like, who's the new auteur? And it's like, it's never that simple. Um, uh, with TV, like there is a notion that it is collaborative. And so we were allowed, you know, it, no one is afraid of us being like, we want to bring in other writers. People are like, great, fantastic, you know. Um, and that was really exciting to be a, a part of a think tank that we were putting together of, of how to make these people feel um, true like to who, the people that they represent, you know. I like how you mentioned that, like, just the perspective when you're trying to write something like that and the minutia of it, because, like, at least with, with this cast, you know, you have a lot of people in it that are from Oakland. You have a lot of some people that aren't from Oakland as well. And, like, how often would you have to, like, let's say, tweak a mannerism or a delivery of something to make it more authentic to the actual setting and to the city, which you obviously have so much passion for and, you know, want to make sure is reflected properly on screen? Yeah, and it's even more so than just the city, right? Like it's the Bay, it's Northern California, but yeah. it's the Bay Area specifically, right? Like we have, there's a lot of variations of the way people talk and like, it's going to get policed by a Bay Area audience anyway, but it's a global show. So like that'll, you know, we're, we'll be the only ones that care about that ju that judgment, but also like, mm -hmm. you know, those mannerisms vary so much. It's like watching Bay Area people argue about slang and fashion is like, and dance and music and all that. Like people like have these hard rules. Like I remember for a while there was this, narrative that locals didn't call San Francisco Frisco. And I was like, oh, but I call it Frisco. Is that some like, like, did, did, am I betraying my home? And I was like, wait a minute, I'm from there and I call it Frisco. That ergo, that rule is not real. <laughs> and that like, I think there's a lot of debate. People get in their silos in your hometowns about what the place is and everyone just feels hella differently about it. So I think with actors, like, we had to really remember that like, we can't give somebody a note that is a reflective of some consensus of the place we're from, because there's no consensus. All we can do is say, people that we grew up around said it like this, you know, or did it like this. Um, and for the most part, like our actors are such sort of methodical artists that they had already done the work. Like Jasmine showed up day one, she had been studying Bay Area speech patterns. Like she's just, you know, that's what you want. It's like, we're not making a documentary. I'm not trying to cast people to play mm -hmm. themselves in a thing. And we want actors to come and like, it, it is, we are breathing life into a thing in a dramatic way, the same way you do with a play. And so we want interpretation. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, you would think we'd have to do a lot of policing, but between Candace and Benjamin who play Janelle and Earl being, you know, from Northern California, she's from Sacramento, he's from Antioch. And, um, and April's from Oakland and San Francisco. You know, some of our writers are from the Bay. Obviously me and David are from the Bay. Like you surround people with enough Bay Area people in a scene and you just like, they just start to do it. it we don't even have to train it. Like people just, slang is so infectious. Inflection is so infectious. Like when you go to New York and suddenly you're from Jersey, like mm -hmm. that's how yep. it feels on our set. It's like, <laughs> you can't help but like get a little bit of Bay in your bones because there's just so much of it around you. Yeah, I'm going to use that excuse next time, because anytime I tweet about the 49ers, I'll say like, oh, yeah, look what San Fran's doing or whatever. And you get a thousand replies. No one fucking calls it San Fran. What are you talking about? No one says that. I'm like, oh, I, I mean, it. like, I, I would agree with those people, but it's not a rule. Like, you can't like, <laughs> like, I'm also not from San Francisco and there's hella districts and there's hella different communities. Like, I don't know what, you know. I don't know what, what people in the Mission District in San Francisco refer to San Francisco as. Like, I don't know. You know, I've got mm -hmm. like two reference points. So like those hard rules are just, that's part of what the show explores is like the multiple, the multitudes and the ways in which people view the place they're from. And who feels like they own it and gets to control the narrative and who doesn't. And I think that's the, that's the fun of a show that is in a place that has a very loud personality. Like the Bay Area is a very big personality because it feels kind of, we feel kind of shit on or like on un, sort of unnoticed. Um, and like mostly, you know, until recently, until the Warriors, like a lot of our sports teams like weren't doing very well. <laughs> so like mm -hmm. we didn't feel, we didn't have a ton of self-confidence. Um, or actually we had, we had a, a lot of self-confidence to compensate for the fact that 
you know, we weren't particularly noticed. Uh, yeah. So it's just going to be interesting to have the, you know, this is kind of, there's been a lot of shows that are based in the Bay, but this one is like very much being like, oh no, it's a Bay show. It's shot in West Dublin. Like it's using Bay music, Bay dancers, Bay, you know, like it's, it's aggressively Bay. I like that you mentioned that too, because I was curious about how just important authenticity was to you and to V Diggs just going into this, because you see like, it does wonders for movies, you know, like even just recently, just to reference like Nomad Land and Sound of Music, like movies that use like Sound of Music used a uh, child of a deaf adult and Paul Rice, mm-hmm. and they used um in Nomad Land used real like people who were nomads. And like you see how that does wonders to the viewer because the viewer now feels more engrossed in this world. And just like how important is that for you? Because like you're mentioning, you're using people from the bay, you're using like real like you're doing these location shots, all this stuff. Yeah, I think you try to make as many of those intersection points work that makes sense. There's like a few different agendas here, right? One is if you're going to do a show about it, I think if you're going to do a show about the Bay, try to do as much of it there as you can. So you can so you can also just put money into the local economy first, right? Then like we're like licensing a ton of Bay Area music that's paying a bunch of Bay Area artists right away. So there's like a there's a um, uh, sort of a political aspect to it of like wanting to wanting to be sort of radically progressive in the way in which we make a thing. Um, and then there's trying to make as many like cultural touch points as possible in the show. Um, but again, that's tailored specifically to me and David's taste. So like everyone's going to feel very differently about it. Some people will think we'll do a great job. Some people will be like, no, you got totally wrong. And then they should go make their own show. You know what I mean, like the idea of doing a show there and doing it this way is so more people can make more shows and we can have a thing like New York has where there's, a million projects about New York and they all feel totally different, you know, and that's, mm. that's fair for that city. There are, there are a hundred different New Yorks, you know, as the same way there are a hundred different San Francisco's and a hundred different Oakland's and a hundred different Bay area stories for all the different sort of disparate cities. Um, and so I think we're just excited to sort of crack that a little bit. Whereas, you know, when they're like, Oh yeah, but Venom is a Bay area movie. I'm like, no, it isn't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's yeah, a San on. Francisco backdrop movie, but like, nothing about Bay Area culture is a part of that thing. It is just a backdrop. You know what I mean? Like we're not, there is no representation of the region uh, unless you consider like trolley cars, like a cornerstone of Bay Area <laughs> culture, which I fucking don't. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, I think they're a mode of transportation. <laughs> it's like saying X-Men 3 is a Bay Area movie because he moves the Golden Gate Bridge at one point or like Ant-Man, for example, another example. Yeah, like, even Ant-Man does like I'll take, well. I mean, Ant-Man is a little bit closer. Like I'll take yeah. The Rock. <laughs> yeah. yeah there you go perfect I'll take the rock is a bay movie because there's a lot of bay in it you know but i think the movies that really sort of speak to to lived experiences are going to fall more into like la mission and last black man of san francisco and bruce mm-hmm. riley's film you know like obviously like the fruitvale station and stuff like that like things that are from there that are sort of the storylines are also about the consequences of the place and, and so people that are from there can sort of go, oh, yeah, like, I, it's not just like, oh, there's a building I know, but like, there's a way of life that I know, which I think is yeah. more unique than the backdrop itself. Like, I think looking at a picture of Oakland, you're not like, oh, shit, well, what a magical wonderland, you know, like, unless <laughs> it's a particularly interesting block, you know, but if you get into it, you can really sort of feel the personality of the place. Getting to know the people in the culture, I completely agree with you. Um, obviously, social issues are like just an important aspect of both the movie and I'm assuming the show. I haven't seen an episode just yet. We didn't get a screener. What do you think it's going to take to create change in something like the prison industrial complex or just in police brutality in general? Because that's something, obviously, you started writing this, like you were saying, 10 years ago. And a lot of those issues remained almost exactly the same as they were 10 years later when the movie comes out. Yeah, I mean, look, I'll say two things. One... I try to remind everybody when we when we're talking about TV is that like it is first a funny half hour dramedy like it's it is not it, it's its job is not to teach you about the prison industrial complex and what you should do about it. If anyone's looking at a comedy show for that, like big mistake. <laughs> like that's no major corporations are funding that show. <laughs> that's not happening. But what it does, what it does do which I think all great storytelling does is it humanizes a real circumstance. And I think what we try to do is tell a very small, very personal story about a family and chosen family dealing with the incarceration of a family member and really focusing on the ramifications outside of the prison, not sort of going in and trying to give this like, here's what it's like in jail story, which we've seen a bunch of times. And I think the first thing that we try to do is, is in the earnest moments in the show is, is, create create or support 
the the opportunity for empathy, then um, I think it's then I think depending on what state you live in, um, there are a number of different ways to become more involved in the the movement to abolish the prison industrial complex in the way that we know it now. Um, so I, I I would first before I start being like here are all the resources you can go look at and here are the websites because let's be real you're not gonna fucking do it. You're not going to do it until that shit's in your heart, until you like truly believe that that system is corrupt and you are motivated to participate. So I'd say the first thing is, if you don't get why it's emo- what, why you should care, here is a show that will show you a, a bit of why, a bit of how it affects people, if it hasn't personally affected you. And I would imagine if people are already personally affected by it, which so many Americans are, because 2.8 million people are in prison and that affects a lot of people, you're probably already doing it. You are probably already a part of that fight. And I just applaud, I just applaud people who already have to deal with that. Um, and I, I hope this show creates a, a space that shows exactly what they go through um, in, in, in navigating that system. I'm super excited to watch it again, June 13th on Stars. The last thing, the last thing I want to ask is we call it the celebrity six pack, which is, or, yeah, we'll call it celebrity six pack. It's just basically you want six movies that you think everyone should watch. They're must watch. It doesn't need to be best. So it's completely subjective to you. Just six movies you think people should watch. Ooh. Can it be recent? It could be one during, doesn't matter. Oh, six movies people should watch. I mean, damn, this is, these are one of those like high pressure situations where I'm like terrified. You throw to a show at too. I'll, I'll let you cheat and throw out a show if you have shows that are on your mind. Everyone has to go see In the Heights because my boy Anthony and Melissa are in that. That's coming out. That's really, really exciting. Um, I'll shamelessly plug The Good Lord Bird, which came out last year that me and David are in because I think it's an exceptional series and I don't think enough people saw it. And that's on Showtime. Um, what have I recently watched that I just like loved? Um, I mean, everybody's watching um, Mayor of Easttown. And I was yeah. like kind of lukewarm on it at first. And then that episode five happened. I don't know if you've been watching yep. it, but episode five is fucking yep. crazy. And I was like, okay, now this is a great show. <laughs> this is a sensational yep. show. That was a really good time. Um, what else has been dope lately? Yo, you know what I went back and did? I, I was just... So me and my my producers, like I, I think they're like way further into um, like one uh, non-American films and just like just older films that I might not have caught. And so they're constantly being like, you need to watch this, you need to watch this. And I was just watching a ton of Jackie Chan's work before he was working in the US mm-hmm. as like as a as a younger director, as, like star, you know, stunt court, like stunt choreographer, all that shit. And I was just like, this dude is so amazing. <laughs> this, mm-hmm. this man is absolutely like one of the most incredible artists you've ever had in film. So I would just, I'm just going to fill up like at least three more of those slots with like, just watch Jackie Chan films that weren't American films. <laughs> just mm-hmm. watch early Jackie Chan stuff. It's so damn good. You know what I watched recently that I really loved was, um, is it called The President's Men? Have you ever seen that? All the President's Men? Oh, yeah. All the President's Men. So good. I had never seen it before. Wow, the writing is so good. Um, Yeah, I'm a sucker for really just beautiful dialogue and scenes that end when they're supposed to. And so, like, that's a movie that does that so well. Again, thank you so much for coming on again. Blind Spotting Series is going to be on Stars June 13th. I'm super excited to watch it. Thanks again for coming on. Man, appreciate you so much. Have a good one. 